ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. You get a call that a clothing store in Hollywood is suffering losses. The value of the stolen property is over $12,000. There's no lead to the identity of the thief. No pattern to his M.O. Your job, get him. Today, you hear these three words everywhere. Chesterfield's for me. The cigarette tested and approved by 30 years of scientific tobacco research. Chesterfield's for me. The cigarette with a proven good record with smokers. And first cigarette to have such a record. Chesterfield's for me. Chesterfield gives you proof of highest quality. Low nicotine. The taste you want. The mildness you want. The Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. And best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 3rd. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.56 a.m. when we got to 1592 Vine Street, Dodd's Men's Store. Excuse me? Yeah? I wonder if you can tell us where you can find Leonard Dodd's. Yeah, uh, that's him, fellow back there in the blue suit. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I don't know how it happened, honey. No, I just came in this morning and I noticed the stuff was gone. Hmm? Well, a whole shipment of suede coats. They haven't even been unpacked yet. Yeah, about two dozen of them. Well, white with a button-down collar. Yeah, I called the cops and the insurance company. Yeah, well, about 12,000. Well, a couple of customers just came in, honey. I'll call you back. Yeah. Well, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. Goodbye. Yes, sir? Can I help you, gentlemen? Mr. Dodds? That's right. Police officers. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. How do you do, sir? You reported a burglary this morning? Yeah, you guys from Hollywood? No, sir. We're out of Central. I didn't think I'd seen you around here before. You want to tell us what happened? Yeah. Come on back to the store. When did you first discover the theft? Well, this morning when I came in, I went back here to unpack some new merchandise, and I found most of it gone. Here, I'll get the door. Now, this is our storeroom. And we got a shipment from the east. The cases are kept here until we get a chance to unpack them and check the invoices. I see. Was all of the stolen merchandise taken from this room? I'm not sure about that. I do know that a shipment of suede jackets and waistcoats was in here. It's gone now. A couple of cases of shirts, too. The only way I'd have of knowing if they took anything from out in the store itself would be to make a complete inventory. Mm -hmm. What do you estimate the loss at? $12,000. When was the last time you saw the merchandise in here? Yesterday afternoon. About what time? Well, I'd have to guess at that. I'd say about 3 or 3.30. How many doors are there to the store here? Just the front one. One in the back opens into an alley. What if we could see the rear door? Mm, sure. Back this way. One of the first things I thought of, too, but it was locked. You opened the door this morning, did you? Yes, I found the stuff gone, then I checked the door. It was still locked. Uh-huh. You have an alarm system in the store? Yes, it didn't go off last night, though. I see. And here's the door. You can see for yourself there's nothing wrong with the lock. How about it, Joe? No, there's no signs of it, Jimmy. Well, that's what I thought, too. I looked pretty close. Couldn't see any sign of where they got in. How about windows? Hmm? Possible they got in through a window? No, I'm sure of that. Only two we've got are in the tailor shop. Here. Now you can see them up there, a good ten feet and barred. They couldn't have gotten in there. All right, we'll have our crime lab take a look. Who has keys to the place? Well, I've got one. Yes, sir, but who else? Well, they're just me and Al. Al? Yeah, Al Baker. He's sort of the assistant manager. Whenever I'm not around, he takes charge of things. Can we see him? Well, you can when he comes in. Listen, I don't want you to give him any trouble. I'd trust him with anything, anything at all. I don't want you asking him a lot of embarrassing questions. All right, sir. How long has he worked for you? Oh, I guess it's been about five years. I don't think I could run the place without him. Sure wouldn't want to try. I see. Besides this baker, how many people do you have working for you in the store? 
three others full-time during rush periods I call in extra help. Can you give us a list of their names? Yes, but you can be sure of one thing. What's that? Isn't anybody who works at the store did this. You seem pretty sure about that. Well, I know my people. All of them have been with me for a couple of years. I trust them all. I noticed that you're doing some remodeling here. How about the workmen? Possible one of them took the merchandise? Mr. Friday, do you know how much $12,000 in clothes is? Yes, sir, I have an idea. The both of you couldn't carry it in one trip. Not in a couple of trips. Whoever took those clothes was here a long time, and he worked hard getting them out of the store. Yes, sir, but about the workmen? It couldn't have been one of them. None of them have keys to the place. We have to open up to let them in, and they leave before we close. If they tried to get the things out of the store, one of us would have seen it. Couldn't possibly have been one of them. Frank? Yeah, you want to call the crime lab? Sure. Can I use your phone? Yes. It's on the counter in front of the store. I just don't understand it. Sir? This doesn't seem to be any way they could have gotten all of the clothes out. No way at all. Well, they must have found one. 10.38. The crew from the crime lab arrived and went over the place. The whole store was checked, and all entrances and exits of the store were checked for fingerprints. Both the front door and the rear exit were examined, but there was no mark of a jimmy. The windows on the second floor were gone over, but the locks on them were secure, and there was no apparent way they could have been used to remove the stolen merchandise. We talked to the other clerks in the store. From them, we got approximately the same story that we'd obtained from the store manager. They verified that the merchandise had been on the premises at 3.30 p.m. the day before. None of them could say for certain that it was there after that, however. While Frank was checking with the members of the crew from the crime lab, I called the names of the employees into the record bureau for a check. Yeah, that's Baker, B-A-K-E-R, WMA, 46 years, 5 feet 10 inches tall, 156 pounds. Right. What? No. No, no visible marks or scars. Right. Joe, I got something for you. Okay, if you'll check the names, I'll give you a call later. Right. What do you got? Come on upstairs. I got talking to Lee, and I figured from what they found, the merchandise had to be taken out in the daytime. Lee goes along with that? Yeah. The way the doors look, if they were open, somebody used a key. Mm-hmm. He thinks like we do, that somebody took the cases out, planted them, then picked the stuff up last night. Well, what do you got up here? A window that opens out on the roof of the next building. We'll check the lock. It hasn't been tampered with. Yeah. Come on. Climb up. No bars on this one, huh? Uh-uh. Over here. Right there behind the air shaft. Now, what is it? Take a look. Uh-huh. Shirts. And this one? Suede coats. Is this all that was taken? No. Manager says it's about half. No sign of the rest of it, huh? No. Must have taken that last night. Figures the thief will be back tonight for the rest. Well, it'll be here. Mm -hmm. So will we. We asked the manager of the clothing store to keep watch on the cases of stolen merchandise while we made arrangements to place a stake out on them. 12.14 p.m. The crime lab finished their investigation and Frank and I talked with Lee Jones. He told us that he checked the fingerprints found on the doors and windows, but that all of them had been eliminated as they belonged to the members of the store staff or to the workmen. He told us that they'd found an impression of a tire print in the dirt of the alley next to the building where the stolen clothing had been found. He went on to say that they'd checked and had found that the truck belonging to the plaster contractor had tires of the same type that had left the impression. The canvas was made of the tenants in the building next to the clothing store, but they could give us no new information on the possible identity of the thief. 3.52 p.m. We checked back with the record bureau on the list of names of store employees. Yeah. When was that? Uh-huh. How long? You get out clean? Mm-hmm. Nothing on the rest of them, huh? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Bye. Anything? Yeah. They checked the names, came up with one possible. Yeah. The assistant manager, Al Baker. Uh -huh. He's done time for burglary. The record bureau had come up with the information that Alfred Roger Baker had been arrested in 1943 for burglary. He'd been tried and convicted on three counts. He'd spent a term in the state penitentiary at San Quentin and he'd been released. Since that time, he apparently had led the life of an exemplary citizen. 4.07 p.m., Frank and I took him to the office of the clothing store to talk to him. Sit down, Baker. Sure. What's this all about? You don't think I had anything to do with this burglary, do you? How many times have you been arrested? Why do you ask that? We just want an answer. You seen the record? We've seen it. You know without me telling you. We'd like to hear it from you. I was arrested once. I did the time. I'm clean since then. I thought when you did the time and they let you out, you didn't owe anybody anything. Yes, that's right. Well, then what are you guys hopping on me for? I just work here. I mean, just because I did a hitch for burglary that I had anything to do with this. We didn't say you did. Well, you sure acting like I did, bringing me in here talking about how I was arrested. You sure are acting like you think I had something to do with this one. Well, you look good for it. 
How do you figure that? You've got the only other key to the door. Look, I don't like to bring this up. Maybe you bright cops haven't thought about it, but who says Dodds couldn't have done it himself? What do you mean? Well, he's in trouble, big trouble. This would be an easy way out of it. All right, you tell us. Well, all the stuff is insured. It'd be pretty sweet for him to lift the merchandise, collect on the insurance, and then sell the stuff, too. It'd come out real good. That's the way you got it figured, huh? I'm not trying to figure it anyway. All I know is that you guys are trying to wrap something around me that doesn't fit, and I want no part of it. Come right down. It must be a couple of guys' work here could have done it. Well, the way we got it, the thief used a key. Well, that brings us right back to Dodds. Well, if he's in trouble financially, then why is he doing all this remodeling? He hasn't got much choice. He's got to brighten this place up or he's going to lose what business he's got. You check into him. You look it up. You'll see what I'm talking about. It makes a lot more sense than you hauling me in here. Can you account for your time last night? From when? From the time you left here. Yeah, I can give you every minute. All right. Go ahead. I left here at 6.30. That's the time I always leave. Who was here when you left? You mean who locked up? That's right. Leonard, he always locks up, always. Where'd you go after you left? Went up to the corner and had a beer. That's like always, too. Anybody in the bar know you? Yeah, the bartender and the waitress. They'll vouch for you? Sure they will. All right, go ahead. After I left there, I drove home. What time did you leave the bar? About 7.10. I had one beer, smoked two cigarettes, put a nickel in the nut machine on the bar and went home. I left at 7.10. Sure wish I knew you were going to want to know all this. I'd have been more careful about remembering. I forgot how many nuts I got from the machine. I'll take a wild guess and say 14. I got no way of proving that. You'll have to take my word for it. What time did you get home? About 7.50. Where do you live? Out in the valley. Traffic's heavy going out at the pass that time, and it took me 10 minutes longer than it usually does. You prove when you got home? Yeah, I can. How? Talk to my wife. We got a time clock on the wall just as you come in the door. I punch in and out. The time will be there. What about last night? I was home all night. I had dinner, sat around to watch television, went to bed. You didn't leave your house, huh? No, not from the time I got home last night until I left this morning. Pretty bad, isn't it? How do you mean that? I can prove every minute of it. Look, you get off my back, cop. You start looking around, you'll come up with a lot of guys who had a lot more chance and a lot more reason to heist that stuff than I do. That won't be hard because I haven't got any. You sit tight and I'll show you who sold that stuff. Huh? Wait a minute. Where are you going? Just over to the desk. I want to show you something. What? You'll see. Hold it just a minute. Now you show me what you want and I'll get it for you. Hey, you cops, you never learn, do you? Open the top drawer. This one? Yeah. All right. I'll open that one. All right, what do you want? Uh, a folder right there. This one? Yeah, that's the one. Put it up on the desk. All right. Come on, open it. Yeah? Now take a good look at the reason the stuff was stolen. What is it, Joe? Bills. There's nothing in the store that's paid for. Take a look at them yourself. Here. Look here, past due. Please remit. Your credit is important. Overdue. Past due. Go through the rest of them. They're all like that. There's no place in the country anymore that'll extend any credit to Dodds. Not one. You're looking for somebody who had a reason to steal the stuff? Well, there's your answer. You talk to Leonard Dodds. He's got the reason. Come in. Joe. Frank, see you a minute. I'll take it. Okay. I'm telling you, you got to lean on somebody. You lean on Leonard Dodds. He's the one. Don't come around here bothering me. Joe. Yeah. You know what he got? He might be telling the truth. Huh? Stuff on the roof. Yeah. It's gone. are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. Meet Peter Lynde Hayes and Mary Healy, America's favorite husband and wife comedy team. They are typical of smokers everywhere who are saying, Chesterfield's for me. Mary says, I've smoked regular sized Chesterfield's for about seven years. Guess that ought to prove how I feel about Chesterfield's taste and mildness. Peter says, Chesterfield's for me, too. As far as I'm concerned, King is the only size. And like Mary says, Chesterfield is the only cigarette. Either way you like them. I'll bet you'll find Chesterfield is best for you. Yes, smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular and king size Chesterfield. The best cigarette ever made. And best for you. <laughs> With the removal of the remaining packages on the roof, our main opportunity of catching a thief was gone. We questioned the people in the store about it. From them, we learned that the manager, Leonard Dodds, had brought the cases of clothing into the store himself. We talked to him, and he offered as an explanation the fact that the insurance company wouldn't like him leaving a supply of expensive suede coats up on the roof. He went on to say that catching the thief was our business, that we were not to interfere with his running of the store in any attempt to apprehend them. We tried to question him regarding the accusations made by the salesman, Al Baker. 
He said they were ridiculous and that we should know better than to listen to the accusations made by an ex-convict. He went on to say that he resented the questions we put to him and that if we intended to continue, he would have to get in touch with his lawyer. We contacted the office and made arrangements for a stakeout to be set up on the roof of the building next door, and then Frank and I returned to the office to check further on Leonard Dodds. We checked with his bank, and we found that he had several notes on the clothing store. The head of the loan department told us that Dodds' payments had been irregular, and that at the time, he was overdue on one of the notes. We contacted the insurance company and found that Dodds had made a claim on the stolen merchandise that morning and had requested payment as soon as possible. We turned a list of the stolen articles over to pawn shop detail and asked them to see that the information would get into the hands of the second-hand dealers in the city. 10.15 p.m. Frank and I filled out the log and prepared to leave the office. You about ready? Yeah, I'll be right with you. I got it. Burglary Friday. Yes, ma'am. Hmm? Well, I'm not sure. No, the officer that handled the case isn't here right now. I wonder if I could take a message. Yes, ma'am. He'll call you when he gets in. All right, uh-huh. Yes, all right. If you'll wait just a minute, I'll transfer you to the main jail. No, the main jail. They'll probably be able to tell you. Yes, that's right. Just a minute. Hold on, please. Would you give this call to 2949, please? That's right, the bail clerk. Thank you. The woman wants to know how much it's going to cost to get her husband out of jail. Yeah. I got it. Burglary Friday. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right, we did. Yeah. Well, when was that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, we'll wait here. Right, bye. Well, looks like we got it made, maybe. What do you mean? Radio car out in the Westlake District just picked up a couple of kids. Uh -huh. Both of them were loaded down with clothes. Yeah. Label on them as Dodd's clothing. The radio car officer had told me on the phone that he and his partner, while making a routine patrol of the area, had spotted two boys walking down the streets carrying large quantities of clothing. When they were stopped, the two suspects were unable to account for the clothes, and they were not able to tell the arresting officers where they'd gotten them. In checking the pair out, the officers had called burglary detail, and we'd gotten our first concrete lead to the thief. 10.47 p.m., the two suspects arrived at the office. Their names were checked through R&I, and they were both found to have misdemeanor records listing petty theft and attempted burglary. One of them, Walter Kramer, had been convicted on burglary charges and had been sentenced to Preston School for Boys. He was at the time on parole. While the other boy waited in the squad room, Frank and I questioned Kramer in the interrogation room. How old are you? 18. Where do you live? You know that already. What are you asking me again for? I told the other cop, gave him all the information. Where do you live? 2574 Brandon Street. You want to tell us where you got the clothing you had when you were picked up? You're smart cops. You figure it out. You on parole now? No, I got out clean. Are you still that way? That depends on how you read this one. Where'd you get those things? I found them. You expect us to buy that? I don't care if you buy it or not. It's the truth. You're pretty heavy, aren't you? I've been around. That time up at Preston didn't do you much good, did it? You'd be surprised what I learned up there. Not what you were sent there for. That depends on where you're sitting. You were picked up carrying a load of stolen clothes. You want to tell us where you got them? You tell me. Now, come on, kid. Where'd you get the clothes? You're going to play it that way, are you? There ain't any other. Where were you yesterday? Starting when? From when you got up. I got to tell you all that? We want to hear it. Pretty dull. All right, go ahead. Well, I got up about noon. You got a job? Yeah. Where? Around. What do you do? Nothing. I'm a philosopher. I study people. I just sit around all day and study people. How do you live? Stay with my folks. They pick up the tab. Go ahead. With what? What you did yesterday. I told you. I got up about noon. Had some breakfast, then went over to Harry's. That's the boy you were picked up with? Yeah, I went over to his house. Sat around and watched the television. How long were you at his house? Mm, maybe six. Sat around and talked philosophy. Talked and watched the old movies. What'd you do then? Left and went out to study people. Where'd you go? Went down, played a couple of games of pool, had something to eat. And after that? Went out to a movie. You got any way of proving that? Sure, talk to Harry. Is he your alibi? Yeah, you talk to him, he'll tell you. Now, you may not know this, but he's in the theft as deep as you are. I got some information for you, cop. Neither one of us is in on it at all. All right, get your coat. Where you taking me? City jail. You gonna book me? You called it. How about Harry? Well, how about him? He going to? Yeah. What charge? Suspicion 459 PC. Burglary? That's right. Come on. You mean that stuff is really stolen? That's right. You're telling me right? Yep. It ain't true. Well, you tell us about it. No, I mean, Harry and me didn't steal the stuff. At least not the first time. What do you mean by that? Well, we stole it. Yeah, you got us cold for that. But not the first time. Well, where'd you get it? From a garage? That's the truth. We stole the stuff from a garage. Where is the place? I'll show you. There's a lot more stuff there, a lot more. Clothing? Yeah. Whose garage is it? I don't know. Harry and me were walking around out there, and we saw this truck pull up. 
Guy got out and then loaded some packing cases. When was all this? Last night. The way the garage looked, though, it wasn't the first time. The place was loaded. A lot of shirts, coats, suits, all kinds of things. Harry and me figured that we might as well help ourselves. But we didn't steal the stuff originally, not the first time. What's the address where the garage is? I don't know. Up on Shortale Avenue, near the light. All right, we take you up there. Will you point it out for us? Sure, I'll show you. I want to see him get his, get it real good. What do you mean? Imagine having a garage full of stolen things. Terrible, that's what it is. Is that right? Sure. The important thing is that you know that we didn't steal it the first time. You've got to believe that. We didn't steal it the first time. Is there really a difference? Twelve fifteen a.m. We talked to the suspect that had been picked up with Kramer. He gave us substantially the same story that we'd gotten from the first boy. They both agreed to take us out to the garage where they'd found the stolen merchandise. Before we left the office, we put in a call to the clothing store, but there'd been no report from the stakeout on the roof. The two suspects directed us to drive out towards Silver Lake. We took the freeway out to Glendale Boulevard and turned right. We drove out to Loma Vista, and then we turned right again. The boys directed us up the hill and then onto a side street. We went about a half a block farther before they pointed out the house to us. We drove down the street and parked the car. Frank and I and the two suspects walked back to the house and into the rear of the yard. A two-car garage in the rear of the building was unlocked. We went in. Scattered around the place, we found several large packing cases of clothing. The labels on them were from some of the most exclusive men's stores in the city. There was no question about it. This was the plant for the stolen merchandise. Frank stood by the back door of the house, and I went up on the front porch and rang the bell. Yeah? You're Martin Hetman, aren't you? Yeah, do I know you? My name's Friday, police department. Oh, yeah, I met you over at Dodge. What is it, some more questions? Yeah, a few. It's kind of late to come around it. Well, maybe a little. I'm just going to turn in. Can you wait till the morning? I could come down to the police department. No, I'm afraid we're going to have to talk tonight. Oh. Okay, come on in. Thank you. Anybody else in the house? Just my wife and the kids. Where are they? Upstairs. They're all asleep. I told you I was just going to turn in. Mm -hmm. That garage out back, does that belong to you? What? The garage out in the back of the lot, is it yours? Yeah, it's mine. Why? What do you use it for? <laughs> what do you use a garage for? I keep the truck there. Well, where's the truck tonight? I left it at a service station down on Glendale Boulevard. Having a grease and the oil change. Why? Anybody else use the garage besides you? No. Everything in it belong to you? You mind if I call my lawyer? Well, you can do that from downtown. You arresting me? Yes, sir. You found the stuff, huh? We found it. That a cigarette? Yeah, here. There's a match. I guess I should have gotten it out of the garage sooner. Mm -hmm. Figured on it first thing in the morning. When you talked to me this morning at Dodds, I should have known. Should have known right then. I didn't think you'd figure it this way. All right, come on, get your coat. Yeah, just let me finish the cigarette. You sure had it figured, going real good. Want to hear about it? All right. Well, I'm a plastering contractor, you know that. Yeah, you told us that this morning. Well, I bid on the jobs. All the contractors submit bids on how much we'll do the work for, you know what I mean? Mm hmm I always got in with a low bid. <laughs> used to drive the other contractors crazy. Never could figure out how I could come out on it. You see it, though, don't you? Well, you tell me. Well, you see, if a job would cost me, say, uh, $3,500 to do, I'd put in a bid for $2,500. I always get the job, and then I'd steal the other thousand of merchandise, see? Mm hmm That way, I could come out and nobody get hurt. What about the store owner? They weren't sure. Only body in the middle was the insurance company, so you see nobody really got hurt. You about finished with that cigarette now? Yeah, just about. You're pretty lucky, you know. Is that right? Yeah, sure. This was going to be the last time. I figured that after this, I'd be able to go it straight. Got my equipment all paid for, money in the bank. Figured I could go it straight. This was going to be the last time. Well, you were right, weren't you? Hey, you mind telling me something? What's that? How'd you tag me? How'd you find out? We caught a couple of kids breaking into the garage. They'd stolen some of the clothes. They were picked up, and they pointed the place out to us. Kid. That's right. How oh, about that? That's really terrible, isn't it? What is? Oh, this younger generation. Now, I had legitimate reason. I was just trying to come out. Wasn't anybody going to get hurt my way. But those kids. I hope you're going to put them away for a long time, little thieves. Come on, get your coat. Let's go. That's just awful. No sense of honesty at all. I sure hate to think of what the world's coming to. You want to tell me something, Hetman? Well, sure. What do you want to know? Well, you said you just stole the difference between what you agreed to do the job for and what it really ought to be. I got it right? Yeah, just the difference. Well, you hit the Dodge store pretty hard, didn't you? $12,000 worth? Well, you see, that was a kind of a deal. Well. I didn't get anything on the last job, not a thing, so I had to make up for it, you see what I mean? Yeah. I had to come out some way. Nobody would expect me to take a complete loss, would they? 
I wouldn't know about that. I just wanted what I had coming. Yeah, well, you're going to get it this time. The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 17th, trial was held in Department 89, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, the next time you buy cigarettes, I wish you'd give our Chesterfields a try. Now, that's all we ask. Just try them, because these cigarettes do a better job of selling themselves than anything I could say. Either way you buy them, regular or king size, I know you'll like them, because they smoke mild and they're really satisfying. Join the millions of smokers who've made Chesterfield America's most popular two-way cigarette. And when you do, I'm convinced you'll agree that Chesterfields are best for you. Martin Averill Hetman was tried and convicted of burglary in the second degree four counts and received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the second degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than one or more than 15 years, or by imprisonment in the county jail for not more than one year. Walter James Kramer and Samuel Arthur Nicholson were tried and convicted of burglary in the first degree. Burglary in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. This is the year that the March of Dimes has started its polio prevention program. And your dimes and dollars are going to determine just how far this program is carried out. Join the March of Dimes and give extra. Give extra for victory over polio. You'll be glad you did. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Harry Bartell, Vic Perrin, Herb Ellis. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. This is it. Save thousands of filter tip smokers who have switched to L and M filters. At last, a filter tip cigarette with plenty of good taste and a pure non-mineral filter. You get effective filtration because only L and M filters use alpha cellulose, entirely pure and harmless to health. It's the light and mild smoke. Much more flavor, much less nicotine. This is it. As Rosalind Russell puts it, L and M filters are just what the doctor ordered. Today, buy L and M filters. <laughs> Listen now to Barry Craig, next on the NBC Radio Network.